Hey guys, it's Scott with Scotty B Cards, and in this video I want to talk about base cards and whether or not they still have a place in the hobby. I think we've swung too far on base cards. We went from them being the primary thing we're buying to now if you're buying base, you're dumb or you're making a bad decision. That's not the case. And I want to discuss that in this video. We're talking about base cards, we're talking about like top series one, top series two, tops update, just the non-numbered, highly printed cards. And we can even look at tops finest, we can look at Bowman's best, they all have base cards in them. All these base cards are printed higher than their serial numbered or image variation counterparts or even the inserts that come in packs nowadays. But base cards still have a place in the hobby. And I think I've even discussed base cards not being a great investment or purchase. And other people have done the same thing. And we were over here too far in base cards and then we swung way to the wrong side. So now in this video, I wanna have an argument for base cards and base rookies of specific years being worthwhile. On top of that, base cards have been around since the 1880s with old judge cigarette cards all the way up until about the 1990s. That's all you had in packs. You didn't really have inserts. And then we started to have insert cards, numbered cards, autograph cards, relic cards came in the late 90s as well. It really changed the game and saved the game. That is very true. Without those base cards be printed and there wasn't much to really hope for when opening a box in 1990 score, you're not going to get much out of it. But now, even if you go back to 2003 with not a great baseball class, you still have a chance to get like a King Griffey Jr. numbered card to 50. You know, there's more value in these boxes because of them. But because the hobby did slow down after the 90s, essentially in 1995, it boomed. And then after the strike in 1994, it really slowed down. From the early 2000s to the mid 2010s, print runs slowed down and there's still a buying opportunity opportunity there. So let's just get into it and discuss that. So I want to talk about the mid 2010s and discuss how many of each card exist. We're looking at top series one for each of these years. And in these years, they all have clear cards numbered to 10. I chose 2014 because that's the first year with clear cards that I could get a real idea of what the print runs were in hobby boxes because they're exclusive to hobby boxes in 2014 top series one all the way to 2022 top series one. And I want to show you how there is some value still in some of these years and how we're kind of forgetting about them. So the first thing is this is print odds. One in every 299 hobby packs, you got a clear card number to 10. Each 330 cards in that checklist each had a clear card. And so you can see it actually stayed relatively the same in 2015. I couldn't find the number, but it decreased in 2016 down to two, one in 232 packs. And then you can see this massive spike in 2017, five times higher. And then in 2018, it goes up almost 10 times higher from 2016. And then it drops a little bit and then it goes way back up. And now we're so far gone at one clear card in every 2000 and 492 packs. But that doesn't tell the full story. And those were just the print odds. It's more important to look at the print runs because every single year things subtly change in these packs. And I'll explain it. You'll see this spike isn't as egregious as previously thought, and I can explain why. But overall, the actual print runs of, you know, we're using the clear cards again, are much lower. You can see by 2017, when we thought there was a spike, it's really only up about 7,000 of each base card in hobby boxes. And then in 2018, that's when you have the real big jump, and it stayed the same until 2021 and 2022. Now we actually are in a point where base cards probably will not ever hold value again just because of this situation. And you're probably wondering why those are so different. It's because in 2014 to 2016, there were 330 clear cards, like checklist of those. And then in 2017 to 2022, it dropped from 330 to 100. It looks much worse because the pack odds obviously had to go up because there's a third of the supply of these in packs. And then in 2019, we actually see it look like it drops quite a bit when it's really the same. And that's because of 2019 introduced a 14 card pack versus a 10 card pack previously in hobby boxes. So you see to know what you're actually paying attention to. And I got these numbers with a really simple formula. You can use these yourself to figure out print runs of basically any hobby only product. What you do is you go right here. We have 10 times 330 because there's 330 cards and they're numbered to 10. And then we went, there's one clear card in every 299 packs. So you go 10 because there's 10 cards in a pack times 299. We got this number, multiply those together. You get about 10 million. Divide that by how many cards are on the checklist. You get about 20 29,900 in hobby boxes for actual cards. So that's how I got those numbers. Let's just discuss why, other than what I already said, base flagship cards will be important. They are the true rookie card, according to Major League Baseball and Major League Baseball Players Association. I know we have all these different prospect cards, all these different really sexy things, the Wander Franco from 2020, Bowman's Best. Technically, it's not a rookie because of this agreement that they agreed upon. Beckett recognizes a rookie because of the way the checklist was formatted, but according to Baseball and Baseball Players Association, it's not quite the case. So there's that argument. But on top of that, you can see that's why this card will 
always be so important and so valuable is because it is identified as the rookie card. The history of Topps flagship is really impressive compared to other sports. From 1952 to right now, we've had a continuous Topps release every single year where we could identify what a player's true flagship rookie card is. In 1952, you have the Mickey Mantle rookie card, technically it was in 51 Bowman, but for Topps sake, we're going to say that. And then, you know, you had Hank Aaron in 54, Sandy Koufax in 55, I believe, Bob Gibson 59, all the way up to Nolan Ryan, I think in 68. And now we have Pujols in 2001. All of this has a really pretty important history for baseball card collectors. And that's why these base cards are going to hold value because they have always been important to us. The parallels carry a premium. Look at this. This flagship image is worth $11,000, but not everybody who collects cards can buy a black number to 67 of Juan Soto for $11,000. It's just not plausible and it's not really something we can afford. So people go for the PSA 10, even though there's 20,000 of them for over a hundred bucks, it still holds value because that is the true Juan Soto rookie card. You could argue the Topps Chrome is better, Topps Chrome update, and it is, but overall, it's still the card people are targeting for that reason. The parallels are too expensive, so we go for the next best thing. The image is consistently reused by Tops. This is Bryce Harper's flagship image from 2012 Top Series 2. It was a short print with no parallels. It was a true short print because it wasn't a variation of anything. His Tops update isn't his actual rookie card. It's a rookie debut card, a little bit different, not a true rookie. But overall, this card has been reused three, four, five different times. Here's two examples. In 2019, Tops iconic card reprints from Tops in 2019. And then in 2021, they had the patch cards as an insert in blaster boxes and so forth. So they keep reusing these images, which reminds us constantly this this is the rookie card. This is the card you want, which is going to boost the value of those cards. As time progresses, you move to the iconic card. There's so many options nowadays that you move to the flagship, you move to the rare cards, you move to the low pop, but overall you always move to that flagship. It's just kind of how it's been. Look at Mike Trout. He has much better card options than his 2011 Topps update. Top Sterling has about 130 PSA 10s and the Topps update has over 5,500, but the Topps update goes for about the same or more because it's the iconic image. And that's just how it is with base cards. And so I'm not saying sell your collection and buy base. I'm just saying if you're a collector who doesn't have the most money in the world and can't afford this, it's a great thing to buy the base rookie because it's still the true rookie of these players. And I think that's something we forget and something we discuss so much that we've really pushed these cards to a spot where I don't think it's fair, especially for certain eras. And know the era of what you're buying. Modern base cards can have value. When I'm saying modern, I mean the 2000 to 2015 or even 2017. Those should have some value, whether it's $5 or $100. Mookie Betts 2014 Tops Update goes for around, in raw condition, 60 bucks. That's good value. Back in the day, $60 cards were really hard to come by. Yes, nowadays we have multi-million dollar sales that kind of skew our view on cards, but they're still valuable. So they can have value. Ultra modern is tough, but don't let like recency bias kill your impression because it's so invaluable for Wander Frank, a rookie, because there may be upwards of 700,000 of them. Because of that, we might think worse of Mookie Betts, 2014 Tops update. But let's think here. Wander Franco has 700,000 of those. Mookie Betts has 70,000. So it's about a tenth of what the population is for the modern, ultra modern stuff. Just because the last few years overprinted doesn't mean everything predating this era is not worth anything. And that recency bias really affects the hobby and it makes sense, but we can't let that happen. Let's look at the mid eighties and before that's all you have are base cards and they were relatively low printed or not in good condition for what's existed since since they weren't viewed as investments like they were in the nineties till now, basically late eighties to mid nineties. It was a major hobby expansion and cards aren't worth much. Obviously you have like the tops Tiffany's you have the rare stuff that could be worth something. You started to get number cards, but the base cards from this era, you can get a Randy Johnson rookie card. One of the best pitchers of all time for a dollar or less in bargain bins at any card shop you go to. I have been buying them like crazy and I don't know why because they're really not worth much. You can get Ken Griffey Jr. Don Russ rookie cards for $3. And it's just because there were so many of them made millions, you know, 5 million of each card type of a situation. And then you had the 2000 to 2017. The hobby was trending sideways after it collapsed due to the strike. And because it did collapse due to the strike, cards weren't printed in that high demand because they had to match supply and demand. They couldn't just keep printing and lose money that way. They were printing hardly any sets in comparison and any print runs in comparison. And another thing that happened in the 2000 to 2017 era. Well, you could even argue it was before, I think 2012 when Topps had the exclusive license or 2011. But what happened was that there were a lot of different sets that existed. And because there were different sets of different manufacturers that also kept the print runs down because there wasn't as big of a demand for top series one when you also had upper deck exquisite baseball cards. And so because of that, they also have less 
made, which makes a different argument why they're valuable. And then in 2018 to 2019, we have another hobby expansion like we saw back here. We can see this hobby expansion go up 2018, 2019, but it's still valuable. You know, there's still value in tops update rookies of Juan Soto and Ronald Acuna Jr. And then in 2020 to 2022, we have another major hobby expansion, kind of like the late 80s to mid 90s. It's not as high. We're still not even close to those print runs. I want to make sure that's abundantly clear. We are not in a junk wax era in any way, but overall, it's still too printed to carry premium value to appreciate over time. But if you know the area you're buying and you can buy according, let's say you want to buy parallels in this area and in this area, but in this area, you can buy a Mike Trout base rookie and it has value. In the late 80s, you probably didn't want to buy base. In the mid 80s to before, that's all you had and so forth. So just know when you're buying, what you're buying, but over the course of the entire history of the hobby, most cards are carrying premiums or carrying value as base cards. So ask yourself if you're considering, is it worth buying? Are there many alternatives? Are there many different versions of this card? When did the player debut and how many sets are they in? That's number one. Number two, how high are the print runs? You can kind of calculate it like I've shown and get an idea of where they're at. How high are the pop counts? You can see the total graded for this Pooh Holes is 2000. PSA 10 is 232. Total graded for this Bo is 27,000 and there's 11,000 PSA 10s. So you can see they're not the same thing. Is the card iconic? Does that potential to become iconic? If it does, that is gonna put a premium on that card like I discussed as we all move towards the iconic cards as we move forward in the future. It's just how it is. And know the era. If you know the era like I showed, then you know maybe what is the right target and maybe what isn't the target. So in popular now, one thing I wanna say is not always popular tomorrow. So just because we're bashing cards now, doesn't mean base cards are always gonna be looked in that light. Once we get further away, these cards become less and less obvious to us. We can't find them as often. And that's when people start pay more for them because they want those cards because they're iconic. And just like how cards people want in 2005 are different than cards people want today, it shows that over time things change and we always go to the iconic stuff. And look at Soldier Boy over here. This was peak men's fashion in the early mid 2000s. And because of that, this is how quick things can change anything in popular culture and our hobby overall. And I just want to point that out. In closing, I think it's excellent. And I still think you should try to buy the parallels and the more expensive cards of different players because that holds a premium and they usually appreciate a little bit more. But don't get crazy. There is still opportunity in base cards. And I think we've, like I already said multiple times, swung too far the other way and it will come back to the middle ground of right when it's a bull market and right when it's a bear market. It'll be right in the middle. We'll get to equilibrium and it'll all make sense in supply and demand. But overall, buy what you like. That's the most important thing in this hobby. Whether you're investing or collecting, buy what you enjoy. You know, it's more fun as an investment. If your investment goes to zero, at least you like looking at the investment you have. If you buy a GameStop stock, do you really care once it goes to zero, there's no utility there for you. But if you had a really cool Randy Johnson rookie card that went to zero, at least have a really cool Randy Johnson card you're attached to from the memories you had as a kid. And that's the beauty of collectibles as an investment is the nostalgia that it has with it as well. But just because people say something, it doesn't make it true. That's even true for me. Just because I'm claiming some things and showing some really cool graphs, it doesn't mean I'm right. I'm not going to, be able to predict the future the entire time. If I did, I'd be incredibly rich. And same with you or anybody else. And anybody else who gets lucky every once in a while still doesn't know everything. So just because we think it might trend one way. We don't really know for the future, but my best guess is that base cards from certain eras still will hold value. Other than that, guys, thank you for watching. Let me know in the comments below if you agree, disagree, what your thoughts are, and I will see you in the next video.